title of our lesson this morning, as I'm sure many of you could guess, are you standing on the promises of God? Are you standing on his promises? We know that the Bible is laced with many promises that are promising and everlasting. Folks, I'm here to tell you this morning that God's promises stand true. Yes, indeed. I know there are several, many promises listed in the Bible, but I want us to look at three promises of God in the New Testament. The first promise that I would like for us to examine is that God promises comfort during our trials. Do you believe that? God promises comfort during our trials. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. If you don't have your Bibles, here's the uh, verse right up here for you. The text reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. There are two solid facts mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3, and 4. And that is God is the source of all comfort. And he will comfort us in every affliction. You know, one man said, thank God for his comfort. Because I don't know how I could overcome the death of my loved ones. Everyone here this morning has experienced pain and suffering at some point in their life. And some of you are experiencing it right now. You are in the midst of pain and suffering at this very moment. Some of you may be dealing with a sick family member. Some of you may be going through something emotional due to the loss of a loved one. Some of you may be dealing with something internally. I don't know what it could be. But there is something we all need to believe in and know for certain. And that, my friends, is God promises consolation during our tribulations. He promises to comfort us during our trials. It doesn't matter what you're going through in life. Know that God's promise here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 4 stands true. You know, people often wonder as they're going through something in life, how does God comfort us today? How does God comfort someone who is going through something? Well, folks, he comforts us through his precepts, his people and prayers. Write that down. He comforts us through his precepts, which is his word, his people, and prayer. You know, when his precepts are read and heard, they can bring comfort to the weary. You know, I remember going on a hospital visit with Milton a few months back on a Monday because one of our brothers had a serious procedure done. Now, typically, when we finish uh, our visits, we always close with a prayer. Well, after the prayer, our brother said, specifically, I need a Bible. I need to read God's word. So, we got him a Bible. A few weeks had gone by, and we decided to go and check on him. Because where he was originally, uh, they had transferred him to a rehab center. Well, church, let me tell you, this brother still had that Bible we gave him three weeks ago. So I said, I still see that you have that Bible we gave you. And his response was, yes, I still have it because I need it. 
Folks, I'm sharing this story with you all because his word brings comfort to those who are afflicted. If you are dealing with the pain of grief, know that his word will provide comfort. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is comforting the Christians in Thessalonica who are dealing with the grief and the loss of a loved one. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, I invite you to turn over there with me. Paul comforts the Christians with these words. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we see the Apostle Paul is comforting the Christians in Thessalonica with the promise that those who have fallen asleep, those who are dead in Christ, will one day be with him. Folks, I have the pleasure of visiting with uh, our brother William uh, twice a week and, and during our visits. He expresses how much he, he loves the fact that, 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 that we're with him. And that's because it brings him comfort. You know, when we're together, he loves verses that talk about staying faithful. And those verses bring him comfort during his affliction. You know, as we're looking at a few verses dealing with faith and being faithful and remaining steadfast, uh, I thought to myself, what verses bring you comfort during your trials? Have you ever asked, that, asked yourself that question? Have, have anyone ever asked themselves that, that question? What, what verses in the Bible bring you comfort during your trials? If you don't have a, a verse or a list of verses, I encourage you to, to, to find some verses um, because you will experience <laughs> trials in your life. You, it, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. But when they do, you should be able to run to those verses that bring you comfort. Folks, we can also depend on the church and prayer because those two things can bring us comfort in our lives as well. When you look at 2 Corinthians and notice what Paul says here. He says, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with we are, which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, it's encouraging to most Christians to know that during their trials, they can call on their brothers and sisters in Christ. Am I right? When you're faced with something challenging, you want, to be able to, you want to be able to call on your brothers and sisters and confide in them and ask them to pray with you. Am I right? Because it is prayer that sustains the afflicted. Prayer sustains the afflicted. When we are down and out, there's our brothers and sisters in Christ we can lean on, and most importantly, it is prayer. You see, when I'm down, I need my brothers and sisters to lean on, but most importantly, I need prayer. You see, church, God promises comfort during our trials, and we can stand on this promise in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. We can stand on it. We don't have to go outside of God's promises to find comfort. God's promises are enough. Now, the world promises comfort in drinking, 
smoking, doing drugs, and eating, gluttony. People find comfort in those things. You know, those promises, my friend, are short term. But God's promises are long term. You see, there is no comfort at the end of the bottle. And a lot of people turn to drinking when they're going through something life challenging, like a divorce. They get fired or a death in the family or an illness. You see, alcohol isn't the way to comfort. It's not. Drugs isn't the way. Neither is gluttony. It's not the way to comfort. These are short term promises that will damage you long term. That's why it is so important that we find comfort in his promise. His precepts, his people in prayer. Comfort comes from his precepts. Not going to find comfort in the things that the world has to offer. They're going to come from his people in prayer. Another promise that we can stand on, my friends, is that God promises to take care of us. Yes, he does. If you open up your Bibles and turn over to Matthew chapter 6, look at verses 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat and what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And you, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Folks, there are several things we can learn from this, this portion of scripture. You see, instead of worrying and focus on the physical necessities of life, we need to focus on putting God first, catch this, and keeping him there. Notice the promise in 633. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, some translations add the word continually in front of the word seek. So it reads, continually seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So by us constantly seeking first his kingdom and righteousness, this will keep us from senseless worrying and obsessing over material things. The Lord promises that if his children seek him first, he will provide the necessities of life. But let me tell you, when a Christian stops standing on the promise of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, they will fall victim to worry and material obsession. You see, the world promises that if you focus on money and material uh, possessions, you will cease from worrying. That's not true. Young people, that's not true. Yes, the world, may, the world may tell us to focus on money and gaining certain things in this life and we will cease from worrying, but that is not the case. 
You see, when a person is focused on money and material possessions, they develop what the Bible calls the lust of the eye. First John chapter two and verse number 16. They are no longer focused on the promise made in Matthew 6, 33. What they are seeking is a promise, like I mentioned before, that is short term. And the Bible warns us about men and women who in the days, in last days, would be lovers of self and lovers of money. Second Timothy chapter three and verse number two. You see, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Folks, Paul is talking to Christians. There have been members in the Lord's church who have wandered away from the faith because of money and their obsession with material objects. You know, there are Christians who buy into the world's promises and they forget about God's promise. They will hold out on the Lord for months when it comes to giving as they have prospered. Instead of setting aside a portion of their income for the Lord as commanded, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, they will put that money in their account with the hopes of gaining more or obtaining a material object. And they will never think twice about giving to the Lord. There are those who habitually miss worship for work instead of worshiping the one who has blessed them with the job. all because they're so obsessed with what the world has to offer. Folks, we should not be captivated by the world's promises. We must stand firm on the promise made in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Folks, we should allow this verse to positively affect our spiritual lives so that we won't be drawn away from what the world teaches. Another promise that, that we can stand on is that God promises new life in Christ. Now, the world will try to impose this obscure view that uh, you can become a new person outside of Christ and that you don't need the church to become a follower of Christ. Now, there are people who genuinely believe this, and they're teaching others the same thing. You don't need Christ to change. And you don't need the church. If you want to have a, a, a new life, just change who you are and be a better you. you know, God will be okay with that. Well, I'm here to tell you that that way of thinking is not right. Young people, if anyone tells you that you don't need Christ or the church, they are wrong according to the Bible. In order for one to experience new life, they must give themselves fully over to Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. You need Christ in the church in order to be a new person in order to be a new creature. You see, the world will try to separate the body from the head. They'll try to do that every time. You see, where there is no connection to the head, when there is no connection to the head, if you are not a part of the body. You know, the Bible clearly teaches that Christ is the head of the church, which is the body, Colossians 1.18. And the only way in is through Christ. And when you are in Christ, you are a new creature. And the old things have passed away and new things have come. So, yes, God promises new life in Christ. And outside of Christ and his church, there is no new life. Outside of Christ and his church, there is no new life. The only way to become a Christian and the only way 
in Christ is through baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. It's the only way. So whose promises do you want to stand on when it comes to comfort? Whose promises are we going to stand on when it comes to comfort? Are we going to stand on the world's promises that we can find comfort in drinking, drugs, and eating? Or are we going to stand on the promise that was made to us by God in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and 3 through 4? Whose promise are we going to stand on when it comes to the fact that the Lord will provide and take care of us? Are we going to stand on what the world teaches? That if we gain as much as possible that we will cease from worrying? Or are we going to continue to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? Whose promise are we going to stand on? We know that the Bible teaches the only way to be a new person and to experience new life is through Christ. Outside of that, there is no life. Folks, God's promises are enough. And I pray that we will stand on his promises. Are we standing on his promises? We know that God promises comfort during our trials. He's promised to take care of us, so we need to keep him first. He promises new life in Christ. So yes, we can trust and believe in these promises without a doubt. Like I mentioned before, the world's promises are fleeting. But God's promises are everlasting. The world's promises are are fleeting, but God's promises are everlasting. For as many are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Folks, let's continue to stand on his promises throughout life. Whatever you're going through, know that you can depend and count and stand on his word. Period. We don't need to go outside of God's promises to find comfort and peace, joy, nor happiness. Everything is right in the Lord. He will provide and new life is in him. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me encourage each and every one of us when we find ourselves going through something, revert back to these promises. Stand on them and do not move. Let us pray. Jehovah God and Father, we thank you so much for your promises. We know, Father, that all your promises are true and we can stand on them and we can put our full uh, faith and trust in your word. I pray, Father, that when we're going through certain things in life, that we will revert back to your promises. When we're faced with difficult things in life, I pray, Father, that we will seek your word, that we will find comfort in your people and in prayer. I pray, Father God, that we will stay focused on the promise made in Matthew 6, that we will continue to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that you will provide and take care of us, that we don't have to go outside of your promises, Father, to find what we need. I also pray, Father, for those who are searching, that they may understand and realize that new life is only in Christ, on your son. Father, be with us throughout the rest of this week, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If there is anyone struggling, or going through something, do not hesitate to come forward for prayer. Do not. But if you are not a Christian according to the New Testament. Do not hesitate to come forward. Folks, the Bible clearly teaches in the New Testament under the New Covenant where Jesus Christ is the mediator. If you want to be a part of his church, 
You must be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Without baptism, there is no forgiveness of sin. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. Only immersion. So if anyone has a need this morning, come forward as we stand and sing.